Namo namaha and welcome back. Now, in this episode, let's quickly turn to another relatively simple topic in this second level of Sanskrit grammar, uh, which is going to be called the gerund, or sometimes absolutive in English. Uh, and in Sanskrit, it's called the tuanta or the lyabanta. Uh, our goal in this video is going to be mainly to learn how to recognize the gerund uh, and then learn how uh, it gets used. Generating the gerund can actually be kind of tricky uh, and it's also going to be kind of it's going to be closely related to another form that we're going we're gonna to learn down the road known as the past passive participle or the bhute kurdanta. So uh, let's table generating the tuanta uh, until we start talking about participles. Uh, the gerund, or the absolutive, is an indeclinable verbal form. This means that it's created off of the verb root, the datu, uh, and it functions as what's called an avyayapada. It's uh, not conjugated, it's not declined, it's going to stay more or less exactly the same in all situations within a sentence. The meaning of the gerund is a bit tricky. Uh, the basic meaning is going to be having done x. Uh, and it becomes a way that you can chain uh, multiple actions together that are done by the same agent in the sentence. Uh, in order to do that, the only way that so far we could do it is to create two different sentences and use the uh, use the in particle cha, right? So for, for example, if you wanted to say, I ate the fruit and went to the forest, uh, you could say aham palam akadam aham wanam cha agacham. I ate the fruit. Uh, this is our lung, uh, and I went to the forest. This is fine, actually, but Sanskrit has a maybe a more elegant and robust way to do this kind of thing. Uh, and this is done uh, by changing the first verb into a gerund and then embedding it into the second sentence. The gerund of the first root kad to eat is going to be kaditwa. Uh, and then you make the uh, following sentence, aham palam kaditwa wanam agacham. I, having eaten the fruit, went to the forest. Uh, in English, that kind of sounds wonky, maybe even pretentious, uh, but in Sanskrit, this is an extremely elegant and robust way of communication. Uh, it's actually probably been influenced by South Indian or Dravidian languages, where, if you can believe it, this kind of usage is even more elegant, even more robust than in North Indian languages. Uh, the power of this gerund actually is that you can string together a whole bunch of actions that the same agent has done into one sentence. You could say, aham palam kaditwa, jalam pitwa, chitram drishtwa, mitrena saha, militwa, gruha patam krutwa, rakshasam hatwa, vanamagacham. This would mean having eaten the fruit. Palam kaditwa, having drunk some water, jalam pitwa, having looked at the picture, chitram drushtwa, having met with a friend, mitrena saha militwa, having done my homework, griha patam krutwa, having killed a rakshasa, rakshasam hatwa, I went to the forest. Aham wanam agacham. As you can see, in English, it's kind of a, a, kind of a clunky sentence, uh, but it, in Sanskrit, it's a very concise and beautiful way to uh, communicate. Uh, maybe in English it becomes easier than just to attach the verbs together with an and instead of this having done X. Uh, so some, some, sometimes uh, you, you can call the gerund actually a converb, uh, doing verbs together. So I ate a fruit and drank water and looked at the picture and met with a friend and did my homework and killed the rakshasa and then went to the forest. Uh, the basic idea with gerunds, absolutives, converbs is this kind of chaining of um, actions together. Uh, you'll hear people use these different uh, English terms for this. Uh, we'll stick to gerund, but in Sanskrit it's called a tuanta because it ends in this suffix twa, twa anta. Uh, it's also called the lyab anta actually because in some situations you're not going to use a twa but the suffix ya, which is called the lyap in Barnumian terms. So that's how the gerund works, how it's used. Uh, let's talk quickly about how it's formed uh, in first as a tuanta, adding the suffix tua, and then the liabanta, adding the suffix ya. Again, there's gonna be a lot of micro granular issues to worry about, uh, and we'll sort of table those for later uh, and uh, return to them when we talk about past passive participles. 
The formation itself of the gerund is fairly easy. And it's kind of parallel to infinitives, if you, if you remember what we just learned. You take the root, but now you use the weakened form of the root, what's known as the zero grade form of the root. Uh, so it's opposite from what we did with the infinitives where we gunated them. This weakening form, this zero grade, uh, we'll learn a bit more about what all that is about in the, in later. But right now, just keep in mind that you don't gunate the root, you weaken it somehow into a zero grade. Uh, then, like with the infinitives, we're going to add our optional ikara. Uh, and again, it's going to depend on if the root is seit, weit, anit. Uh, remember, uh, seit roots are the ones where the i is mandatory. Uh, uh, you have to put in the it. Uh, anit roots, remember, are going to be where it is forbidden. You don't have the it. Uh, and then the weight roots are going to be uh, where sometimes it's added, sometimes it's not, depending on what the construction is. Uh, after the optional e, the third step is going to be to add the suffix twa. And so we get uh, so the gerund or the tuan the. Uh, for example, for kru to do or make, there is no e added and we end up with kru twa, meaning having done or having made something. Uh, for smru to remember, same process. No ikara, and we end up with smrutwa, having remembered. Same thing with bu to be. Bu is a weight root, uh, so in the where in the infinitive, uh, it, the e was added, and we had bhavitum. Here, for the gerund, it's not added, and we get bhutwa, having become. Uh, an example of a seit root uh, would be but to read, which becomes patitwa having read with that e injected into it. Kad, to eat, becomes kaditwa, having eaten. Uh, we will encounter certain sandhi issues here, and that's where it gets tricky, especially if our root is ending in a palatal consonant. Uh, so for the root tyaj, which means to abandon or throw something away or someone away, uh, we get tyaj plus twa, no e added. And what's going to happen here is that our j our palatal voiced uh, unaspirate uh, is going to be, remember it's radioactive, so it's going to jump up, up to the velar class, first becoming thyag, and then it loses its voicing to match the unvoiced condition of the th, uh, the t in thwa. So we get thyak thwa, having abandoned, having thrown away. Other verbs ending in palatals, on the other hand, might jump down to the retroflex. One example of this is drush, our very common root, to see. The sh is a palatal s, right? The sh gara. Uh, the twa uh, <coughs> then is going to force it to change. When you have drush plus twa, it, it, what happens is that the sh jumps to the retroflex. Uh, so we get drush twa. The th also has to assimilate to that retroflex. And the irregular form we can mention here is suruj, which means to create or emit something. This is going to become surushtwa, having emitted or having created. Other strange things are going to happen when our roots end in a long a. So for da to give, it's going to become dattwa, having given. In contrast, the roots ta, to stay or stand, is going to turn into sti uh, before that twa suffix, and we get stitwa. Similarly, dha, meaning to put or place, now it's going to turn into hi, and we get hitwa uh, uh, for having put or placed. Uh, likewise, the root ma, which means to measure, will weaken to mi with a short e, and we'll get mitwa, having measured. Ba, to drink, uh, weakens to a long e, actually, and we'll end up with bitwa, having drunk. Uh, on the other hand, some a ah roots will stay a. Ah. So ya to go stays ya, and we get ya twa, having gone. The root nya to know stays the same, and we get nya twa, having known. Uh, so it's not really something you can predict. Uh, you just have to, again, remember by encountering forms, by making mistakes. Uh, of course, we'll already, always know what it means because the twa will give the, away the meaning of having done x. One important set of situations we can mention here is when the root ends in an um or an un, like gum to go, num to bow, rum to enjoy, yum to control, hun to kill, mun to think. These are all going to be weakened by dropping that final nasal before adding the twa. So gum becomes gat twa, having gone. Num becomes nat twa, 
having bowed. Ram becomes Ratva, having taken pleasure. Yam becomes Yatva, having controlled. Han becomes Hatva, having killed. Man becomes Matva, having thought. Similarly, if a root has an infixed nasal, meaning it's a form CVNC, where N is any nasal, the weakened form will often drop that nasal. So for the root dosh, which means to bite, uh, the weakened form will be just dash. Uh, and then we add your thwa, the palatal S is going to again jump down to the retroflex, pulling the dental T with it, and it becomes dashtwa, having bitten, drushtwa, having seen, uh, dashtwa, having bitten. Another one is band, which means to bind. The gerund off of, will form off of bud, and we get badwa, having bound. The interesting sandhi here is worth looking at. Bud plus thwa. Here the thwa is going to assimilate uh, to the voiced aspirate dh. So first it becomes bud dwa, and since Sanskrit can't tolerate two aspirates stuck together, the first dh will reduce to an unaspirated version. So we get bud dwa, having, uh, having bound. Other roots uh, will work similarly with aspirates. So bud, meaning awaken or learn, becomes bud dwa. Again, the thwa becomes dwa, uh, and the dha of the root itself will lose its aspiration and become the unaspirated dha. Bad dwa, having been bound. Bud dwa, having awakened, having learned. It's the same thing that's going to happen in Buddha, actually, uh, and we'll very soon learn how the name of the Buddha came into being as well. One important uh, weakening I wanted to mention here uh, has its own kind of fancy grammatical name, which is samprasarana. Uh, in this situation, if you have a root that begins, begins with the syllable wa, meaning the letter wa, the wakara, followed by the letter a, uh, the akara, uh this wa is going to turn into its corresponding vowel u before uh, you add the twa of the gerund. The most common of these, you'll see all the time, is watch means to say or speak, watch first turns to uch, and then you add the thwa, and then you get, and when you do that, you have a sandhi, the chakara will jump to the vilarka, and it becomes uktwa, having said, watch to say, uktwa, having said. This happens to uh, roots that start with the syllable ya as well. This will turn into the corresponding vowel ikara. Uh, the example to remember here is yaj, which means to sacrifice, which will first become ij, and then you add the thwa, there's a sandhi magic that happens here, and we'll, uh, the palatal will retroflexize, and we'll end up with ishtwa, having sacrificed ishtwa. Two notes on this samprasarana rule. One, it doesn't apply to roots if they have a different vowel, if it's like vi or vu or yi or yu, yuj, to join harness control, will just become yuktwa, having joined harness or controlled. Wish, which means to enter, will become rishtwa, having entered. Uh, finally, I wanted to point out that roots that end in the letter H, the hagara, are often have peculiar stuff going on. So the root dah, which means to burn, will weaken first to dug, actually, with a velar voiced aspirate that appears, the gara. Then you add the thwa, and we get sandhi magic again, and it ends up as dugdwa, having burnt. So the same with duh, which means to milk a cow. The, this first weakens to dug. And then by adding the thwa, this turns into dugdwa, having milked. Now we can contrast the situation here with the root lich, which means to lick. It's cognate with the English word lick. Right? Lich first turns to lidwa, using a retroflex voiced aspirate. Another root like lich uh, is the dhatu ruh, which means climb or mount. This becomes rudwa, having climbed or having mounted. Uh, there's many other examples and rules for us to learn in the formation of the thwanta, this gerund or converb or absolutive. And again, we'll be learning, uh, we'll be returning to the microgranular questions of how to do it in later videos. Right now, again, as long as you recognize how to uh, recognize how, how they are formed uh, by n noticing that thwa at the end, you know it means something like having done X, where X is going to be a verb that's chained to our main conjugated verb. If you can remember, the monkey, having eaten the fruit, drinks the water. Or if you like, the monkey eats the fruit and then drinks the water. That's, uh, that's how the gerund works. 
That's the tuanta version of the gerund, and it works for all verb roots. Uh, weaken the root, add the optional ikara, and then your suffix twa to get having done x. Now, if the verb has a prefix, though, an upasarga, uh, then a different set of rules have to be applied to get the same gerund form, or absolutive, or converb, or whatever you want to call it, having done x. The traditional term for this uh, suffix you add is uh, the lyap, uh, and so it's called a lyabanta. Uh, this ya is the lyap. That you add. The formation of the liabanta is actually a little bit easier than the thuanta. There's fewer exceptions. Uh, most of the roots, when you have a prefix, uh, you take the prefix, you add the suffix ya to the weakened form of the root. So for pari plus tiaj, uh, which is going to mean to abandon or forsake, to throw away, we'll get pari tiajya, having abandoned, having forsaken, having thrown away. Anu plus dnya, which means to give your permission, this will turn into anu dnyaya having given permission. A uh, plus ruh, which is going to mean mount or climb onto, will become a ruhya, having mounted. Upa plus wish, which means to sit, becomes upa vishya, having sat. Very sim simple, straightforward, nothing too tricky. If we have a prefix plus a root, though, that ends in a short vowel, then we'll add a takara in between, uh, a t <laughs> before the ya. Uh, in effect, we're adding the suffix tia. So if we have vi plus smr, which means to forget, we get vismrutya, having forgotten. Anu plus kr, which will mean to imitate, so they will get anukrutya, having imitated. Vi plus g, which means to conquer, will turn into vijitya, having conquered. A plus i, which means to come, uh, will turn into etya, having come. O plus e, e. Uh, then there are some roots that end in um, where we get either ya is added or tya is added to this weakened root sim. So for a plus gum, uh, meaning to come, we can have either a gatya or a gum ya. Both are possible, both mean having come. V plus ram, which means to relax or enjoy yourself, we can have either viramya or viratya, both meaning having enjoyed yourself. So that's how the Lyabanta gerunds are formed. Uh, again, a lot of different forms to learn, but the basic idea uh, we'll, we should try to keep in mind is that first, the gerund or absolutive or converb, whatever you want to call it, is indeclinable, uh, which means, uh, and it means having done X. And it's used to chain verbal actions together with the same agent, the same doer. Uh, if you have a prefix, uh, what's called, uh, then we use the lyabanta forms, where the suffix ya is added to the weak version of the root, or tya is added uh, with the root when the root ends in a short vowel. And then finally, there's no if there's no prefix, then you add the suffix twa to the weakened form of the root with an optional ikara that's added for the uh, sate or vate verbs. Uh, so that's uh, that's it. That's how the gerund works. We can stop here. We can take a break. Uh, I'll urge you to review maybe by comparing how the gerund works with the infinitives that we learned last time, this tumun. They're very similar in how we form them. Uh, and if you start to learn to recognize them, it'll help expand your knowledge of Sanskrit verbal forms in very useful ways. Next time, what we're going to do is take on another important verbal form, which is known as the verbal noun, the lyut pratyaya in Sanskrit. This form is actually going to help us immensely in expanding our usage of the Sanskrit bhasha, the language of the gods. So until then, thank you for watching. See you next time. Gunar milamaha, mevadaha,